Okay, good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I have my green tie and my shamrock, I mean my green shirt and my shamrock tie. But anyway, uh, today's St. Patrick's Day and uh, a lot of people, I think Kevin was telling me he didn't know that there, there's a real St. Patrick, but there was a real St. Patrick and we're going to talk about him today. But I was reading recently where there was a lady who was getting a uh, uh, she's going to go get in her car from Walmart and she was going to go home and so this guy jumped in her car with a gun and says lady I want all your money and she says I'm not giving you my money and he said if you don't give me your money I'm going to kill you she says I'm not giving you my money and if you want to kill me I'm going to go straight to Jesus Christ because he's my personal Lord and Savior and she said if you knew Jesus Christ the way I knew Jesus Christ you wouldn't be going around robbing people she said I'm sure your mama would be disappointed in the way you've grown up and he says what do you mean about G knowing Jesus Christ and she shared the gospel with him he burst into tears and asked Jesus Christ to be his Lord and Savior he did get arrested because he broke the law but she kept up with him in prison and he grew to, to know and to really love the Lord. If you're faced with a situation to where you realize I'm facing something that because of Jesus Christ, I could die. I could die for Jesus Christ. I was reading recently where they talk about all of these, these terrorist cells that are all across America. We've had millions of people come across our southern border. We've had, I've seen uh, pictures of the video of young men who are, are military age coming in from China with no wives and no children with them. There are terrorists coming over from other parts of the Middle East over around the Muslim nations. They're coming into our country by the thousands who had no children and no wives. People who are in the know say that there are terrorist cells all around America. And they're waiting on the signal to come after us. And one of the top things they're going to do is to come into churches because churches are here with their backs to the door where there are a lot of people to shoot and to kill for Allah or for Communist China or whatever they're going to do. And we may not realize that it could crank up at any time. Muslims call Israel the little Satan. And they call the United States the great Satan. Satan hates us because our nation was founded upon biblical principles. We have a lot of Christians here in the United States. Satan hates Israel because Israel was God's chosen nation. Not that, not that all Jews are saved. But Israel is the God's chosen nation that God chose to show the world what it would be like, how he could bless a nation that honored him. Never in the history of the world has a nation been destroyed and, and ceased to exist and 2,000 later, 2,000 years later, come back into existence. But that's happened with Israel. More and more nations are ganging up around the world against Israel, but they will never destroy Israel because God has already promised that he will always protect his chosen nation. Okay, so anyway, uh, we're going to take a look at some folks in Scripture, and there are many, many, many folks who loved the Lord so much that they would be willing to die for Jesus Christ. Now, we are quick to say, oh, I'd die for Jesus until we're in that situation, and we know we're probably going to die. Or if I go here and do this in obedience to the Lord, I could probably die. And so uh, we have our friends Benny and Cheryl, and they had plans to go back to Israel in May of this, coming, this, of this year. And uh, they want to still minister to the Jews there and uh, get Jesus Christ uh, shared with them, uh, share with them Jesus Christ as their Messiah. However, the airline says, no, we're not going to Israel. So they had to cancel their trip. And I told Benny, I said, y'all be careful when you go over there before he found out they couldn't go. And he says, we're going to go and we know we may die, but we feel like the Lord wants us to go there or at least plan to go there. So I have different folks I want to look at today and then I want to go over to uh, St. Patrick and talk about him. So I want us to just look real quickly over at the book of Esther. 
Now, most of you know the story about Esther. There is the king, uh, Xerxes. He was king of Persia because the Persians had conquered the Babylonians. And so Xerxes was now the king of Persia. He had a real good-looking wife named Vashti. And he was real proud of her because it made him look like a stud. And so he had a party one time for all of his, all the people who were in, uh, ruling his country. And the party lasted for 180 days. That's half a year. I mean, there's a lot of drinking and eating going on. And so one, one day when everybody was plastered, he sent word to his, his queen, Vashti, and he says, I want you to come in here and do the hoochie-coochie. I want everybody to see how good looking you are. And she said, no. You didn't tell the king, no. She says, I'm not coming. And so he got really angry. And so he asked some of his advisors, what should I do? He says, well, if your queen gets away with this, all of our wives are going to pull the same stunt and they're going to disobey us. And so you need to get rid of her. And so he says, okay. So he just told her to hit the road. And they says, you need to find another queen and get one just as good looking or better looking than Vashti. So they went around looking for all the good looking girls in town and they ran into Esther. Now, Esther's parents had died and her older cousin, Mordecai, raised her. And she was raised to love the Lord because she was a Jew. Mordecai was a Jew. And so the king didn't know anything about that. But so they came in one day and says, King, we found a babe for you. Woo! Her name, is, well, I'm going to call her Esther. Her name is Esther, and she is a doll. And he said, well, bring her in here. So, man, they brought her in, and he says, yeah, she's real good looking, but y'all fix her up even better. So they got her all kinds of makeup and perfume and fixed her all hair and stuff. And so she became the queen, and she was gorgeous. Well, there was another guy in the, in the, in the realm there who was kind of like the prime minister, and his name was Haman. And he was a typical politician. He didn't care about anybody but himself. He was always promoting himself, promoting himself, promoting himself. We live in a society where a lot of people like to promote themselves. God is the one who promotes. And so he was promoting himself, and he thought he was doing really, really well. And so the king made a decree one day. He says, whenever Haman goes down on his donkey or his horse, I want everybody to bow down to him. And that was an order from the king. Well, he would go by and Mordecai, Mordecai knew that Haman was an Amalekite. And God had told Israel, you destroy all those Amalekites because they're just, they hate me and they're pagans. Well, Haman was a, an Amalekite. And when he went by, everybody would bow down to Haman, but Mordecai refused to do it. And somebody says, hey, Haman, there's a Jewish guy named Mordecai. And when you go by, he won't bow down to you. And Mordecai, get, I mean, Haman got bent out of shape. He got upset. And so, and so he thought, I'm going I'm to shorten the whole story here. He said, I'm going to build a gallows in my front yard. And I'm going to figure out a way to get this guy, I'm going to get him hung on those gallows. And so um, anyway, to make a long story short, he decides, I can't kill him, but I can maybe find out a way to kill all the Jews all the Jews in Persia. Then they can kill all of them, including him. But he didn't know the queen was a Jew. And so he goes to the king and he says, King, there's these people here in this country and they're just, they're multiplying like rabbits and they don't believe a lot of things that you believe and they're not loyal to you. And I think, Lord, we ought to exterminate them. And the king said, that sounds good to me. So he signed a decree and it was going to be April of the following year. And he said, the April of the following year, we're going to kill all the Jews. And Haman says, if, if you decide to do that, I've got 10,000 talents of silver, which adds up to 300, according to the people who wrote the, the note I wrote in the thing, in the Bible, seven, 375 tons of silver. And he would donate it to all the different people that killed all the Jews. And any Jews they killed, whoever killed them got to have the Jews', the Jews home and valuables or whatever. So everybody's all excited at a certain date in March, I think it was March the 7th, we're going to kill all the Jews in the whole empire and we're all going to get rich. Well, Mordecai found out about it and he went and told Esther about it. And he says, Esther, 
the king has signed a decree according to the Medes and Persians, which means he can't change his mind, that on March the 7th of next year, we're all going to die. They're going to kill all of us. And he said, you need to go to the king and tell him what's going on. And she said, but I can't do that because he's, all, he's got all these other women in the harem. And he's, she said, I hadn't seen him in a month or two. He hasn't called for me. And if I go into his presence unannounced, the penalty is death. And so I want to read here about this, starting in Esther chapter 3, starting, on, starting in verse 12. So on April the 17th, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Haman dictated. And he was sent to the king's highest officers, the governors and the respective provinces and the nobles of each province in their own scripts and languages. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Dispatchers were sent by swift messengers into all the provinces of the empire, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March the 7th of the next year. The property of the Jews would be given to those who were killed. A copy of this decree was issued as law in every province and proclaimed to all the peoples so that they would be ready to do their duty on the appointed day. And at the king's command, the decree went out by swift messengers, and it was also proclaimed in the fortress of Susa. Then the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa fell into confusion. When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes and he put on burlap and ashes, and he went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was a great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. When Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. Then Esther sent for Hath Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed as her attendant. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and found out, find out what was troubling him and why he was mourning. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave Hakath a copy of the decree issued in, Jew in Susa that called for the death of all Jews. He asked Hathak to show it to Esther and to explain the situation to her. He also asked Hathak to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. So Hathak returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. Then Esther told Hathak to go back and relay the message to Mordecai. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his golden scepter. And the king has not called for me, she says, to come to him for 30 days. So Hathak gave Esther Esther's message to Mordecai. Mordecai sent a message, a reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace that you will escape all the other Jews who were killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. For who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And if I must die, I must die. She's willing to take a stand for the Lord and for her people. She was willing to die in obedience to God. Well, she went into the king and he looked at her and she looked sad. He said, what's wrong? She says, I'm, I need to speak with you. So he held out his scepter and he didn't kill her. And she says, I'm, I'm really upset and sad. And he said, well, tell me what it is. And she said, before I tell you, I want to invite you to a banquet. And so she invited him to a banquet and they had a wonderful time. And then he says, now tell me what the problem is. And she said, I want to invite you and Mordecai, I mean, you and Haman to another banquet. And then I'll tell you. 
So they come in and Haman found out about it. He was all excited. He went home. He's going, he said, man, I am in, in with the queen and she's going to have a banquet for just me and the king. And I'm so excited. I'm a success. So he went bopping in there to the, to the banquet. And they had their, their banquet, and so the king says, tell me what's going on. And she said, this Haman, this wicked Haman, has determined to kill all the Jews in the empire. And Mordecai, my cousin, saved your life when people were plotting to kill you a while back, and he was never rewarded for that. I also am a Jew. And so according to your decree, which is according to the Medes and Persians, that can't be changed. So your wife, me, myself, and I, I'm going to die on March the 7th of next year. Well, the king got quite upset. And he went outside onto his balcony and he was really mad at himself and he was really mad at Haman. Well, the queen was lying there on her chase lounge. And so Haman came in, was begging for his life. And when he was begging for his life, he slipped and fell across the queen, sobbing and saying, oh, please don't let him kill me. The king happens to walk in and Haman's laying on the queen. And he says, you dare to assault my queen in my presence. Take him out. And he found out about Haman had the, the gallows in his front yard. You take Haman and hang him on his own gallows that was meant for Mordecai. So Haman got hung. Mordecai was advanced up to the prime minister of the nation. And the king says, I can't change the decree for all Jews to be killed, but I can pass out military weapons to every Jew in the whole empire, and I want y'all to fight back. And everybody was so scared of the Jews. There were so many of them and had all these weapons. They didn't, uh-uh, we ain't, uh-uh. So they backed off and all the Jews were saved. Esther was willing to die for that which is righteous and good. She was willing to die for the Lord and she was willing to die for God's people. Then I want us to go over to Acts chapter 14. And Acts chapter, actually Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, we see Apostle Paul and he's on a missionary journey. So starting on verse 46 of Acts 13. Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, it is necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews. But since you have rejected it and you have judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we will offer it to the Gentiles, non-Jews. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have, made it you, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and they thanked the Lord for his message. And all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. So the Lord's message spread throughout the region. Then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and the leaders of the city. And the, <clears throat> they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. So they shook the dust from off their feet as a sign of rejection. And they went to the town of Iconium. And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Down to chapter 14. The same thing, hap same thing happened in Iconium. Paul and Barnabas went to the Jewish synagogue and preached with such power that a great number of both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles became believers. Some of the Jews, however, spurned God's message. And they poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas. But the apostles stayed there a long time preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. But the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them. Some sided with the Jews and some sided with the apostles. Then a mob of Gentiles and Jews along with their leaders decided to attack and stone them. When the apostles learned of it, they fled to the region of Lyconia, to the towns of Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding area. And there they preached the good news. While they were in Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he never had walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached, looking straight ahead at him. Paul realized that he had faith to be, to be healed, so Paul called to him in a loud voice, Stand up! And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. And when the crowd saw that Paul, what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, These men are gods in human form. 
they decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus and Paul was Hermes So he was, since he was the chief speaker. Now the temple of Zeus was located just outside of town. So the priest of the temple and the crowd brought bulls and wreaths of flowers to the town gates. They prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. A lot of people today would be going, hey man, appreciate that. You know, I'd be able to buy my Learjet now. But when the apostle, apostles Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothing in dismay and they ran out among the people shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings like you. We have come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. In the past, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops, and he gives you food and joyful hearts. But even with these words, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium, and they won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul, and dragged him out of town, thinking that he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. After preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas decided to return to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia. And I'm sure Barnabas would say, what are you talking about, Willis? where they strengthened the believers. They encouraged them to continue in the faith, reminding them that they must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. So Paul was stoned, and they thought, the, the, the people who stoned him, they thought he was dead. He looked like a dead man. They drug him out of town, dumped him off in a ditch. Paul came back up, went back into town, told some people goodbye, and the next day they took off. After they went preaching in these other towns, of all places, he went back to the same town, Lystra. Why would he do that? Paul wanted to go encourage the other believers. If you follow Jesus Christ, there's a chance that you will be persecuted, and there's a chance you may even be killed for the Lord. But you hang in there because if you truly know Jesus Christ, there will be times where you will suffer persecution and possible death. And he encouraged them. Paul loved Jesus Christ enough to go back to a place where they stoned him and left him for dead and dumped him in a ditch. And he went right back there again to encourage the Christians, don't let that scare you. Be willing to, be suff to suffer for Christ and be willing to die for Jesus Christ. Then we go to Philippians. And as you'll notice in the, on the screen, it, it had Ephesians. <laughs> Philippians. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. <clears throat> Starting verse 27. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. Well, I'm scared. If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you don't have to be afraid of anything. We don't have to be afraid of anything. Nothing can touch you without God's permission. And whatever He allows to happen in your life, He will use it for His glory. There are Christians today who are suffering. They're suffering in prisons. They're suffering in places around the world where Muslims will go in and kill every Christian in a church. There are Christians in America who are suffering with illnesses and all kinds of terrible things. But God will allow things to come into our lives only for His glory. And if we love Him, we are willing to be a living sacrifice for Jesus Christ.
For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for Him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Now, we're living in 2024, and I don't care what anybody says. We are living in the last days. Everything for the tribulation period is falling into place. And even this past week, uh, President Macron of France has no long, is no longer a dove. He said that Russia's out of line, and he's going to stand with Ukraine. Russia's talking about they have their nuclear weapons ready to go. France says we also have our nuclear weapons ready to go. And different countries are talking about nuclear war like we talk about collecting Easter eggs. We've never had that before. They have had nuclear weapons in the past, but nobody mentioned it because they're afraid somebody's going to push the button. We're living in a time right now where everything that's prophesied about the tribulation starting has, is it's all into place. The Jews don't have to build their temple until after the tribulation starts. And they're ready to do it now. They're already they're, they're talking about possibly sacrificing one of the red heifers during Passover of this year. And in order they, to, to, to dedicate the temple and to have it cleansed from from the sin of other people, the red heifer has to be sacrificed and the ashes sprinkled. They're talking about doing that during the Passover this year. If that's the case, if that's the case, we could possibly experience persecution here in the United States because President Biden has allowed millions of undocumented people to come across the border, not just from Mexico and South America, but from all over the world. And there are a lot of nations that hate us. And they're coming together, if they so see fit, to destroy us. Now, here's the way I look at it. Hey, if they come, they're going to come. We can't stop it. The mission field will be coming to us. So we'll have people to witness to. But at the same time, we could have people who are into drugs and prostitution and all kinds of wicked sin moving into our area. I don't know what's going to happen. But we need to be willing to suffer for Jesus Christ and to even perhaps die for Jesus Christ. So we get into chapter 2 of Philippians. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one, per one mind and one purpose. We have that in our church. I pray that it continues. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. So in everything that we do, we don't want to be secretly trying to make a name for ourselves. We don't want to secretly be, uh, be trying to promote ourselves. We don't want to secretly be trying to impress uh, others with ourselves. No. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. If you, if, if you exalt yourself, God resists the proud. He will fight you. And sooner or later, He will humiliate you. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests. Some people do. Some people in churches look out for their own interests. Some pastors look out for their own interests. Some church leaders look out for their own interests. But take an interest in others too. It talks, somebody accused me of being a hireling one time. I said, a hireling? A hireling, according to John chapter 10, the hireling runs off and leaves the sheep because he doesn't care about the sheep. I said, I don't run. I'm not a hireling. I don't run. There are people who don't care about the sheep and they leave. A lot of pastors, they just, they're in it for their own glory and they leave. The average pastor stays in the average church in the United States two years. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though He was God, 
He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and he was born as a human being. He, when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the highest, the place of highest honor. So if we want to be elevated, we are to humble ourselves before the Lord and he will, he will honor us in due time. And he gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Today, you can talk about God on TV. Nobody's going to blink an eye. But if you mention Jesus Christ, they hate it. If you're an athlete, you say, I give all the glory to my Savior, Jesus Christ, they cut you off. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there. I think we lost the signal. People hate the name of Jesus Christ. So if you talk about being a Christian, don't say that several years ago I gave my life to God. Don't say that. Which God did you give your life to? Oh, I've got this good friend. We talk about God all the time. Well, that's good. Which God? It's the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So Jesus Christ loved his Father and obeyed his Father enough to die for you and for me on the cross. And we were talking about that in Sunday school today. We hear that Jesus died for us on the cross. We're used to hearing that. But when I sit down and I think about specific sins in my life that I have committed, and I know that Jesus Christ went through a trial all night long, and then he went before the Roman government in the morning, and at 9 o'clock in the morning, he was nailed to a wooden cross and he hung up there naked on the cross for six hours because of those sins that I think about in my life, I put him on the cross. I put Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus died for the sins that I have committed. I'm guilty, but he took my punishment. And Jesus loved you and he loved me enough and obeyed his father enough that he was willing to die when he never did anything wrong. Now, just real quickly, I'm not going to talk a long time about St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a real person. He was born in A.D. 386 in Roman-controlled Britain. His real name, his real name was uh, Maywin Sukkot. And so if that was my name, I'd probably name myself Patrick too. He changed his name when he was going back to Ireland as a missionary, but I'm jumping ahead right now. Patrick means in Latin, father figure. But he was, he was born in Roman-controlled Britain. But at age 16, he was captured by Irish pirates. And he was carried against his will to Ireland as a slave. The Roman soldiers left Britain because they feared the, pirate, the pirates. They, caught, they described them as howling, evil, demon-possessed demon savages. He was forced to lead sheep on the top of a mountain. I forgot the name of it. For six years... And he was up there taking care of those sheep in all weather, including rain and snow. He was raised a Catholic, but he didn't have any desire to be a Catholic. But he had heard about Jesus Christ. And during those six years of living total misery, he realized, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he trusted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he wrote his autobiography called Confessions. And he said, like King David, he spent most of his time morning and at night praying and worshiping the Lord. If you tried to escape or you went against your captors, these guys, Druids, they were Druids, they would cut your head off and mount your head on a fence post. They were savage people. Any of their enemies, they would round them all up. And each year they would build this giant form of a man, 
made out of wood, tree limbs and sticks and logs or whatever. And it was called the wicker man. And the wicker man was so large, they could put a lot of people inside there. They pack them inside wicker man. And then that night, they would dump oil on it and set wicker man on fire. You could see it for miles. So he was up there for six years. And he was praying. And one night he had a dream. And in the dream, God spoke to his heart and he said, you're going to escape. And if you go to the coast, you will find a ship waiting there to go back to England. So one night he was able to escape and he walked 200 miles to Dublin. And sure enough, there was a ship and he had no money and he begged the guys on the ship. He says, please, please, I've been a slave, a captive for six years. I just want to go back home to England. Please let me go. So they said, okay, they felt sorry for him and he got to go on the ship and he got to go back home. He wanted to study the Bible, but there's no place to really learn it. So he joined a monastery, not to become a monk. He joined the monastery to study the Bible. And for several years, he studied and studied and studied. And all of a sudden, God spoke to his heart. Like God told Paul, after Paul was stoned to death in Lystra, left for dead in Lystra, God says, Paul, I want you to go back to Lystra and encourage the believers. God told God told Patrick, I want you to go back to Ireland and share Jesus Christ with those savage Druid people. He knew that if he went back, the chieftain there had, had promised anyone who escapes, he's going to be beheaded and we're going to put your head on a fence post. Or if we don't do that, we're going to put you inside a wicker man. He went back. And he began to share Jesus Christ with the people over there. And God had prepared their hearts. And thousands of people across Ireland came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And during that time, he actually was able to lead the, the, the chieftain of the, tri of the group of people, led him to Christ. And Patrick started churches all over Ireland. And he became the patron saint of Ireland. Now, People say, St. Patrick, he must have been a member of the Catholic saints. He was, never, he was never a Roman Catholic saint. He was the patron saint of Ireland because they loved him. And so he led many, many people to Jesus Christ. Now, in his, in his autobiography, here's what he writes about his Savior. He wrote, Every day arrives, I expect either sudden death or deception or being taken back as a slave or some such other misfortune. But I fear none of these things, since I look to the promise of heaven, and I have flung myself into the hands of the all-powerful God who rules as Lord forevermore. My God, omnipotent King, I humbly adore Thee. Thou art King of kings, Lord of lords. Thou art the judge of every age. Thou art the redeemer of souls. Thou art the liberator of those who believe. Thou art the hope of those who toil. Thou art the comforter of those in sorrow. Thou art the way to those who wander. Thou art the master to, me, uh, to the nations. Thou art the creator of all creatures. Thou art the lover of all good. Thou art the prince of all virtues. Thou art the joy of all thy saints. Thou art the life perpetual. Thou art the joy in truth. Thou art the exaltation in the eternal fatherland. Thou art the light of light. Thou art the fountain of holiness. Thou art the glory of God the Father in the height. Thou art the savior of the world. Thou art the plentitude of the Holy Spirit. Thou sittest at the right hand of God the Father on the throne reigning forever. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I rise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye uh, in, the, in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Patrick died on March 17th, 461 A.D. He lived a life to glorify Jesus Christ. 
And today, Satan has changed St. Patrick's Day into green beer, drunk Irishmen, and leprechauns. And that's not what St. Patrick's Day is about. If you had the chance, would you be willing to give your life up for Jesus Christ, knowing you'll never see your husband or wife or your children or your grandchildren or your friends ever again? That they will take you into a jail cell? They will lock you up? They may, like Apostle Paul, take you out and chop your head off. Or they may, like Peter, make you have you crucified upside down. Or like all the other apostles who were murdered or who were martyred for Jesus Christ, except possibly John. Are you willing to die for Christ? You say, yes, I am. Well, are you willing to live for Christ? People all across America in Christian churches are talking about leading lost people to Christ. The only problem is most Christians never do it. Most Christians never share the gospel. Never. Not one time in their whole life. How many times in your lifetime have you sat down with a lost person, got into a conversation, a friendly conversation, and shared word for word the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lost person? I've never done that. I've never had that opportunity. I'm not good, a good speaker. I don't know what I would say. If you were offered $10 million to learn how to share the gospel, you would quickly learn how to share the gospel for $10 million. It's a shame when Christians say, I'm willing to die for Christ, while people are dying and going to hell, and most Christians in America have never personally shared the gospel word for word for even, with even one person. When you get to heaven, will there be somebody there that prayed with you to receive Christ as their Savior? I put on uh, Facebook one time, when you get to heaven, will Jesus Christ Christ come up, up to you with a big smile on his face and say, there are a lot of people up here in heaven because of you. Would you like to meet them? Not that you saved them, but you shared the gospel with them. What are you living for? Are you living for your grandkids or for your kids or for your spouse? Are you living for your fancy home? Are you living for comfort? Are you living to go home and watch the ball game on TV? Are you living to tend your flowers in your yard? Are you, are you living to, to be a hunter, a hunter or fisherman? Are you living to, to shop at the different stores around town? What are you living for? Paul said all those things are important to him. He called them, and he didn't say rubbish. The new translation say rubbish. The word means dumb. Paul said all the things that were valuable to him, they were poop when he came to Christ. So on this St. Patrick's Day, I hope that you think about St. Patrick. Think about Patrick. <clears throat> there are monuments all over Ireland honoring him taking the gospel to the people of Ireland. It has nothing to do with snakes. I don't even think they have snakes in Ireland, but he didn't run snakes out. He, read de he ran de demons out. Let's close in prayer. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I'd like for you to come down to the front. If you, uh, if you decide in your heart, I've never led anyone to Christ. I've never tried to lead anyone to Christ. But today is my day. I'm going to get a bunch of tracks out of the track racks out here. And when I get into a conversation with somebody, I'm just going to say, hey, can I give you something? Hey, you seem like a nice person, and you, I think you would be a good friend. And I give this to all my friends. And this thing, the message of this little booklet changed my life several years ago, and I've never been the same. And I'd like to share it with you because I care about you. And, and if I can help you, if I can talk to you about it or take it home and read it, this tells you how you can be totally forgiven by God and how you, when you die, you can know for certain without a doubt that you're going to go to heaven. And if they look at like they're interested, say, D does that interest you? Sure. And then I'll tell them this. If you'll give me a few minutes, I promise you this, I will not try to force you to do anything. I will not try to sign you up for something. I will not try to get you to join any church. I will not start sending you letters or emails. I just want to give you the information from this little book, how when you die, 
you can know for sure that you belong to the Lord and you're going to go to heaven. And if you never want to hear from me or see me again, that's fine because I'm not going to try to do anything or twist your arm. I just want to give you the knowledge of how to do it. And then share with them. And when they realize you're not going to be twisting their arm and you're not going to be coming out of their house all the time, and you're not going to be sending them letters and getting them on the phone, then they might say, well, if he's not going to pressure me, yeah, you tell me.